Okay, um, let's get started. So uh, we're very happy to have Clay Tordova. Clay is the Neubauer family assistant professor at the University of Chicago. Um, he did his PhD at Harvard under the supervision of Truman Bafa. And then he was a junior fellow in the Harvard Society of Fellows, and then a long-term member at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton before joining uh, University of Chicago in 2019. And Clay is also the first person that I met in graduate school. We were literally sitting next to each other at the orientation meeting. And that was the beginning of one of the most important and exciting episodes in my scientific life. We spent um, hours every day um, trying to teach each other quantum field theory, um, arguing and um, discussing and complaining a lot about the standard law and the standard textbooks. Um, and now Clay is um, one of the pioneers in rewriting one of the most important chapters in the standard law, the chapter on symmetries in quantum field theory. Symmetries are some of the most powerful and general structures that we have. Um, and Clay has introduced new types of symmetries and shown new ways to use symmetries in quantum field theory. So um, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction. I'll try to move on to it. Um, so yeah, I'm going to tell you about uh, symmetry in quantum field theory. And we will start from sort of 10,000 feet and uh, then zoom in and get a little more specific. So of course, uh, symmetry plays the foundational role in physics, I have highlighted some uh, some key applications in the pillars of, of modern physics, uh, kind of physics from the 20th century, quantum mechanics. Uh, really, uh, at the beginning, all about symmetry. It defines our basic observables, like energy and momentum and spin. Those are all concepts related to symmetry. Uh, relativity is all about uh, about chasing down the consequences of uh, Lorentz invariance and other symmetry principle. And of course, in quantum field theory, uh, it organizes particle types. We have this particle zoo, which is uh, governed in a sense by symmetry. Now, so th this will be a talk building on that last uh, that last point about quantum field theory. So, what is quantum field theory? Uh, from the point of view that I'll take, it's a, it's a unifying framework for theoretical particle physics, lots of hard condensed matter physics. Um, and also early universe cosmology, quantum gravity, maybe other applications. I asked GPT-4 recently, some new applications of quantum field theory, and it, it told me maybe photosynthesis. Uh, <laughs> interesting. Uh, and, uh, so many early applications uh, of quantum field theory, of course, involve weakly interacting particles. That was STAR, how to, how to sum up uh, interactions uh, in these famous Feynman diagrams. Maybe if you're someone who's interested in uh, the muon magnetic moment, you might be furiously summing these diagrams right now, um, uh, though maybe you're not so interested anymore. Uh, now, formal quantum filter today is, is beyond this, uh, this weak coupling paradigm. In a sense, part of it is a quest to understand strong coupling, uh, to understand general properties of quantum field theories away from perturbation theory, and to extract some general lessons. And that would be kind of the the place where we will be for most of the talk. Then we will come back to particle physics uh, at the end. So these general lessons will pay dividends in particle physics. Now, when you talk about uh, quantum field theory in condensed matter theory, often the symmetries that you're interested in are emergent. And you're often trying to characterize universal properties of long distance physics. So here I've drawn, for instance, these uh, famous Ising model phases. Uh, here are uh, here are the three different phases. Here's this the critical point, and much of the uh, the macroscopic uh, behavior um, is uh, is unclear from the picture until you zoom out and you can describe it in a in a universal way using quantum field theory. So uh, that's one, another key area. Okay, so these two areas that I mentioned, particle physics, at least at general coupling and condensed, hard condensed matter physics is the subject of phase transitions. They have kind of a unifying problem, uh, which very broadly you might say is given some interacting microscopic constituents, how can you determine the long distance macroscopic or emergent behavior? That's the big problem. And the big challenge that you face is that you might start with things that look weakly coupled at short distances like 
fluctuating spins or weakly interacting particles. But as you try to go to the distance scales that you're interested in, try to run the renormalization group, the coupling gets stronger, and the kind of true long distance degrees of freedom might be strongly coupled composites of what you started with. That's the problem with strong coupling. So, of course, the an example in particle physics, a kind of unifying challenge, is quantum chromodynamics, where at short distances we have quarks and gluons weakly interacting, that's asymptotic freedom. And at long distances, uh, uh, we have confinement and uh, we have complicated composites. Now, the main theme of this talk is that we're going to develop new notions of symmetry in quantum physics that can constrain uh, dynamics at all couplings. So we're going to uh, see a new kind of toolkit that can help us understand this problem in general. What kind of questions might we want to ask if we have such a, a toolkit? What, what are the big problems? Well, one kind of problem is the question of phases and field theories. Well, what do I mean by phases and field theories? So the question is, given a Hamiltonian with some fixed symmetry, what kind of infrared behavior is possible? So we're trying to distinguish properties of the ground state or of the extreme long distance physics. And how can you organize it? Well, one way to organize this phase of the quantum field theory is with respect to this symmetry. You could have a symmetry preserving phase where charged fields have expectation value zero. Or you can have a spontaneous symmetry breaking phase where there's something like where there's some degenerate factor. So that's one axis that we could use to uh, organize the long distance behavior of physics spontaneous symmetry breaking versus not. Another axis that you could uh, that we're often interested in is the mass gap. So uh, is the system at long distance long distances gapped? Gapped. Um, uh, another word for that is maybe it's a first order transition, um, or we might say it has a, it's a topologically ordered phase. Or we might be interested in the opposite case where the system is in a second order phase transition, so is gapless, and there might be something like conformal symmetry covering those phases. So these are our two different big axes that we, when we think about phases of field theories, we think about the math gap, and we think about how is the symmetry that we started with realized in the vacuum. Now, of course, that idea of organizing phases by symmetry, a very old idea, um, uh, famously goes under the name of the Landau paradigm. So, uh, again, what's the goal of this paradigm is to organize infrared behavior in quantum field theory by patterns of symmetry, as I summarized on the previous slide. And usually you have a picture that is uh, like that illustrated here. This is a paradigm of uh, phases via order parameters. So you imagine that there's some order parameter and there's some effective potential for this order parameter. And as you dial uh, some coupling, or say something like the temperature or some other relevant parameter, the shape of the potential might change. And you might go from a potential like this, which has a minima away from the origin, in which case uh, something is condensed and a symmetry is spontaneously broken. Or you might go uh, into this phase where uh, nothing is condensed and the symmetry is preserved by that. So that's sort of the standard Landau paradigm of symmetry realization. And here, the phase is being controlled by a local operator or a local quantum field condensate, so for instance, something like a magnetization. Now, this uh, Landau paradigm, okay, it's great. We learned about it in the textbooks, but you might, uh, you might say, well, maybe it's more like a delusional fantasy. Why? Well, there are, there are lots of phases that don't seem to fall into that standard Landau paradigm. At least, uh, at least in the most vanilla form that I presented you. So what are some phases that we might want to understand? Some very important ones that we can't really formulate in the way that I said on the previous slide. One is coming back to, to gauge theory is the confinement deconfinement transition in gang mills. So that is uh, that refers to the behavior of Wilson loops, that is the energy between probe quarks. Uh, and whether that, how does that energy grow with distance? Now, 
this probe quarks form a Wilson loop, and we're asking about the area law versus perimeter law. So this is not a local operator condensate anymore. This is a loop excitation. So it's outside that paradigm that I said before. And another one that is uh, very important in condensed matter physics is the phenomenon of topological order. You can have a system that is gapped, but has long range correlations. And again, that doesn't seem to be governed by any traditional notion of symmetry. So here's a little picture of some anions describing topological order. And so uh, one, one reaction to this is to say, well, okay, the, the Landau paradigm is, is not general enough to abandon it. But another reaction, which is the point of view that I'll, I'll take today, is that, no, it's, it's our understanding of symmetry that's a problem. Actually, something like the Landau paradigm can hold with a larger, more expansive view on what we mean by symmetry. And we'll see that both of these examples can be brought into something like a generalized Landau paradigm if we enlarge our concept of symmetry in a natural way. Okay, so that was one kind of uh, question, the question of phases of field theories in the Landau paradigm. That's another big question. Another big question is to do uh, something you might think of as like modern metaphysics, which is to chart the space of field theories or the space of Hamiltonians. What kind of questions might you ask if you're thinking about the space of uh, theories? Well, one thing you might ask is for some very coarse features, like for instance, what are the connected components of the space of theories? So by that, I mean, what field theories can be connected by any kind of continuous deformation? What is a continuous deformation? A continuous deformation might be uh, integrating out some massive fields or doing your normalization group flow, something that is connected by continuous parameters or tuning couplings and masses, that's something that's related. So here, here are some cartoons of, of, of the space of theories. And you know, if you know, if you knew how to label these components, that might be actually extremely useful for thinking about strong coupling problems. Because maybe you start in the ultraviolet up here, and as the renormalization group flow runs, it translates you around here in some path that you don't really understand. But at least if you understood these connected components, you would know that okay, you could never get all the way over to here. So these are some coarse topological features that we would like to understand about the space of quantum field theories and the space of Hamiltonians. And okay, one, one crucial point is that these spaces should be labeled at least by symmetries and various properties of symmetries that they enjoy. Okay, so those are the big uh, questions from, from uh, 10,000 feet. And now I'd like to tell you a little bit more about this tool. Um, uh, th this new tool, this new kind of symmetry. And I'll start uh, in the context of gauge theory. So we'll, we'll start learning about this higher concept of symmetry. And I should say, of course, that, uh, that one of the foundational papers uh, in this area was written by Anton in the audience. Um, okay, so, so let's start with the question of, of Maxwell's equations. So we like to understand can we think about the free photon and Maxwell's equations in vacuum as something having to do with symmetry? So Maxwell's equations describe electromagnetic uh, waves, and at the quantum level, you have massless photons. And the, the question, if you want to think about it from the point of view of symmetry, is can you come up with a symmetry-based reason why the photon is massless? Now, of course, there are lots of old ways of thinking about that, uh, but uh, but we'd like to, to have a, a, a more modern viewpoint of symmetry on this. And the clue that you should think about is in these two equations, these are actually, these Maxwell equations are actually like conservation equations. They're conservation equations for a current. We think F mu nu is conserved. That's a current, but with two indices. And similarly, the Bianchi identity, this second equation, can also be viewed as a conservation equation. So one says that these are currents for a so-called higher symmetry. And higher, in this case so far, just means there are more indices on the current, more than the usual, say, J mu. So this is the first clue, that the equations of motion are conservation equations. And you can ask, well, what is charged under these higher symmetries? So this is a, I, I'm not telling you anything you don't know yet. We're in free Maxwell theory. 
the, the charges, the symmetries, you know, they have to be familiar in a sense from electromagnetism, but I'm reorganizing that. So we could look at surface integrals of the field strengths. So for instance, we could look at Gauss's law where we integrate the electric field over some surface when we get an electric charge. So this is the, the thing that we want to call the charge is uh, under these higher symmetries. And the charged objects are then test particles, either source electric or source magnetic charges. If we do the magnetic version of this. Now in space time, if we're relativistic, these test particles sweep out world lines. These are Wilson lines, or if we're doing the magnetic version, Tope lines. And so these one-dimensional world lines, these one-dimensional trajectories of charged particles, these are the objects that are charged under this higher symmetry. So that's, you should contrast that with sort of more ordinary notions of symmetry, where the charged things are point-like operators. Now, I began this discussion about higher symmetry with the question of, can we explain why the photon is massless? So let's revisit that now that we have this uh, notion of symmetry. So we can look at this higher current, F mu nu, and we can act it on the vacuum. We can act it on, on the state zero, that's the vacuum. And it has a non-trivial matrix element with a one photon state. So P here is some momentum and epsilon is a polarization. So you get this uh, one of the first matrix elements that one learns how to compute. And you should compare this matrix element to that for a spontaneously broken ordinary current, J. When an, when an ordinary current is spontaneously broken and it acts on the vacuum, it makes a one Goldstone boson state with this matrix element here. And so there's a direct parallel between these. You can see that you're making the one photon state and therefore, you could conclude that this higher symmetry is spontaneously broken, and the photon is the goldstone node. This is a symmetry based explanation for masses. So, that's the first hint that we're onto something here is that we have a, a symmetry based way of realizing why the photon is massless. Now, Three quantum field theories have a lot of symmetries. So if all I had to tell you about was some new language about Maxwell theory, I don't think it would be very interesting. And one of the major points is that no symmetries like this survive turning on couplings that we care about and help us understand real interactions. So let's talk, for instance, about SUN Yang Mills theory. What are the symmetries here? Well, okay. At short distances, we have, as I said before, weakly interacting spin one particles. And at long distances, the coupling becomes strong. And the important point here is that the interactions allow gluons to screen test charges. So the, 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 the raw charge of a source particle is not directly observable. Um, but on the other hand, it can't be completely screened. And that's kind of a key point. So, so gluons cannot screen a single quark completely, but they can screen any quarks. So this is true for all values of the coupling. And this, this number mod n that's well, that's well defined in this screening calculation uh, is a new quantum number. It's the quantum number of a Zn higher symmetry, not a, not a continuous higher symmetry, but a discrete one. And the world lines of heavy quarks have charge one modulo n. Now, this Zn symmetry is the key to bringing the confinement deconfinement phase transition back into the Landau paradigm. The point is that this Zn higher symmetry uh, is either spontaneously broken or not, depending on what, depending on whether the theory is deconfined or not. So. In a confined phase, we have an area law for Wilson loops. The energy grows with distance. And this Zn higher symmetry is preserved by the vacuum. You could think that there is a flux tube between uh, probe quarks. And in a deconfined phase, one has a perimeter law. And this Zn higher symmetry is spontaneously broken. So 
that's already sort of progress in the direction that I was saying. I, I gave you at the beginning uh, some examples of, of phase transitions uh, that seem outside the standard Landau paradigm, but now with the enlarged notion of symmetry, they're back in being characterized by just spontaneous symmetry breaking or not. The same thing could be said for anions and topological order. The topological, what do I mean? So we're in two spatial dimensions. We have particles with unusual spin and statistics, but we can all we can think that say abelian anions in particular can be viewed as charged objects under a one form under a higher symmetry. Sorry for slipping into technical language. And so, uh, more generally, we think that a topological order is a certain pattern of emergent symmetry, often spontaneously broken. So again, that brings this this second uh, kind of litmus test example, topological order, as I mentioned, into this framework. So there's a notion of symmetry where we can think of those phases as realizing a certain pattern of symmetry. Okay, so so those were two examples. Uh, uh, I gave you this, this first notion of higher symmetry in gauge theory, and I showed you some examples of how it can help us think about some challenging phases. And let me now say sort of in a more general way, what, what is the modern definition of symmetry that I'm working with here? So this is, if you like, something about the triumph of the spherical cow. So we, we teach our students that a Gaussian surface, when we, when we study electromagnetism, that it could be any shape. So we could integrate the electric field over this cow, and we would get the charge. And you should compare this, uh, this kind of integral here, to an ordinary charge, call it Q, that you, or could be a momentum or anything else like that, some, something standard. And that usually defined by integrating a current over all of space. So what's common between these? This integral of the current over all of space, or the integral or, or the Gaussian surface? What's common to these? If you look about this time slice uh, picture, is that we could change the time slice, and then we could compare that to this this uh, example up top. What that means is that both of these are examples of topological deformations of the symmetry algorithm. So one here is shifting the time slice, and the other here is wiggling the surface where I do the the uh, the Gaussian surface integral. So. Let's try to abstract from that a little bit. In quantum field theory, charges are operators, and a typical operator would have very complicated position-dependent correlation functions. But the conserved charges of the type that I have been talking about are very special. Their correlation functions are topological. That is, they don't depend intricately on the positions. If I wiggle their support in space-time, the correlation functions stay constant. So that gives us our modern working definition of symmetry in quantum field theory. We say that this, the, the modern paradigm is that symmetry in quantum field theory is just all the topological operators that you have. That encompasses the ordinary notion of symmetry and all the subsequent higher notions of symmetry, both the, both the ones that I've told you about so far and uh, future ones that will appear later. So this generalizes the concept of charge. We have extended objects like particle world lines that are charged. And it will also generalize um, something uh, like the algebra of symmetry, something, something like uh, the group characterizing the symmetry. Because the fusion of topological operators, their operator product expansion, is something richer than that. that takes us outside the usual framework of groups and uh, characterizing symmetry. Now, this point of view about uh, topology characterizing and defining what we mean by symmetry also uh, makes good on this idea that I wanted symmetry to be something that is constant under a normalization group flow. So renormalization group flow is a continuous transformation between it's scaling up space and time. And topological effects are going to be constant under that. So this provides us with a kind of uh, a kind of sort of definition that guarantees that anything that we might call a symmetry in this framework is automatically scale invariant, and in particular preserved under a normalization group flow. So that's why it would be helpful to characterize strongly coupled phases or other uh, uh, or other kind of universal properties that we might be interested in general coupling. 
Okay, uh, I can't help but mention uh, that topology also, uh, you know, once you say that there's a, uh, a link between topological uh, operators and, and symmetry, you're, you're firmly in the realm of topological quantum field theory. And this builds some kind of bridge uh, to modern mathematics and this subject of higher categories. And there's a really fruitful uh, correspondence right now between uh, like the mathematical side building up what this, this kind of algebraic framework for thinking about symmetries and the physical applications for applying them in real phases and physical problems of interest. Okay, so we started with uh, these, these big problems. We developed, we talked about some new notions of symmetry. We'll see yet some more later. But let's first say sort of what, what kind of new things can we say in theory, uh, with these uh, with these results? What, uh, what what can we really say? So uh, the Clay Math Institute has these famous uh, millennium problems. One is about Daniels theory, and you know, my name is Clay, so these are my problems. <laughs> um, so SUN Yang Mills theory, or the theory I keep coming back to, uh, is believed to be gapped and confined at long distances. And actually, a stronger statement is conjectured. Uh, what, what do we really believe about that? Not just that it's gapped and confined, but actually, the IR is the infrared is trivially gapped. So there's not even any topologically ordered degrees of freedom at long distances. The theory is really empty. That's what we really believe. Now, you, you might try to poke that statement and see how robust it is. So one way to poke is to look at other gauge groups. So this was about SUN. What about SON? Let's generalize Maxwell from U1 to SON. U1 is SO2. So in this kind of problem, in, in SON gauge theory, there is a Z2 times Z2 higher symmetry. There's an electric Z2 that measures quarks. It measures uh, whether uh, it measures the vector representation of quarks, modulo two, and gluons can string pairs of quarks in this theory. So that's a mod two quantum number. And there's a second magnetic mod two quantum number under which magnetic monopoles, probe magnetic monopoles carry charge. Again, that's a mod two quantum number. And you can ask, what is the infrared behavior of this theory? So it, is it like S, is it like SUN Yang Mills where it's trivially gapped, not even topological order? And actually, you can you can utilize this higher symmetry to prove that this theory cannot be trivially gapped. And the kind of picture that you develop from this is that the electric charges are confined, but the magnetic charges are deconfined and free. So this is the kind of RG flow that you might envision from this is that uh, in, in the ultraviolet at short distances, you have SO and Yang Mills theory. And the infrared at long distances, you have some discrete gauge theory with deconfined uh, deconfined monopoles. This is like a higher symmetry analog of charge fractionalization in the quantum hall. So that's something that you can establish rigorously. This that the infrared here cannot be trivially down. Another thing that people have studied with this framework is about the phase diagram of SUN Yang Mills itself. So uh, when we poked, uh, when we talked about SUN Yang Mills at long distances being uh, being confined and gapped, what we meant was that theta equals zero. So theta is this theta angle that appears here, and you can think that this coupling theta is very similar to a magnetic flux in the particle in the particle on a ring. Um, so it plays a very important role in, in the standard model in the strong CP problem, if you talk about SU3. And there are two special values, theta equals zero and theta equals pi, uh, that are distinguished by having a time reversal symmetry. And what I talked about before, about being confined in gap, that lore was for theta equals zero. And you might ask, does it hold for general theta? And okay, for all values of theta, as we talked about before, SUN has this, SUN Yang Mills has this higher ZN symmetry. And if theta equals pi, one thing you can prove is that uh, the infrared cannot be trivially gapped. 
So unlike the theory of theta equals zero, where the standard law is that it's it's just empty at long distances, if you tune the coupling to hit this critical value theta equals pi, we actually know rigorously that it cannot be. That's something that had been believed for some time, but now this has been has been firmly established. In fact, you can say more. Uh, you can you can characterize some aspects of the nature of the phase that exists there. There are three possibilities. At least one of the following has to hold. It either has to spontaneously break time reversal, or be deconfined, or be gapless. One of the three must hold. And actually, the lore is that uh, it uh, spontaneously breaks time reversal, which leads to exactly stable domain walls in two graphs. So these are rigorous new results about this foundational quantum field theory that I only know how to establish using this higher symmetry. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, let's keep going in our, in our adventure of symmetry. So far, um, we've talked about higher symmetry. We've talked about phase of the VH theories. Um, but is that it? Are there, are, are there yet even more symmetries to uncover? And if we take the viewpoint that symmetry is anything topological in our system, then actually there is yet another growth avenue for this uh, new paradigm of symmetry. And that has to do with duality. So let's, uh, what is duality? There are a variety of possible definitions, but the, the one I'll, I'll invoke here is that duality is when one quantum system has two or more classical limits, two or more ways to think about it classically. And usually a duality just relates these two different classical limits, no one is preferred. Sometimes though, it actually happens that a system can be self dual it can be invariant under a duality transformation. That's a novel kind of symmetry, and that's something that is fundamentally quantum in nature. It doesn't really have a classical analog. Now, what's an example of that? It sounds very, uh, very abstract. Uh, one example, a key example for which to learn things, is the Ising model. So I started with the Ising model. Let's go back to it. Here I'm in the Ising model in one spatial dimension. This is a space-time picture. And this Ising model has Kramer's Vanier duality, something that's been known for about 100 years. And the Kramer's Vanier duality exchanges the high temperature and low temperature phases. But if you sit at the critical temperature, then the Ising model is invariant under duality. So that's a new kind of symmetry that exists at the critical point, kind of self duality symmetry or a Kramer's Vanier duality symmetry. And it's very unusual in how it acts on the degrees of freedom in the theory. I've tried to visualize that here. So here is the symmetry. It's like a charge operator. And when we cross the symmetry, it's going to act on the operators. On the left is an order operator, something whose condensation it would tell us whether we spontaneously break or not the fundamental Z2 symmetry of the Ising model. And on the right is a disorder operator something uh, which is attached to the Z2 symmetry itself. And what this duality symmetry does is it allows you to change the disorder operators into the order operators by proxy. That's something fundamentally new. Usually uh, symmetry maps an operator of a given type to itself, to an operator of the same type. Here we have a change in type of the operator in order to disorder. Now, this actually allows me to kind of more satisfactorily think about this picture of eyes and phases from the point of view of symmetry. We could talk about what characterizes these different phases in terms of symmetry. Before thinking about duality, we just had the Z2 symmetry. So here, the Z2 symmetry was spontaneously broken. That's what this no means. We had a phase where every, all, all the grid was white at long distances and a phase where it was all black uh, and the state where it was all black at long distances. Then we had the high temperature phase where the symmetry is restored. Uh, so, okay. But how could we character, how could we distinguish this from the point of view of symmetry from the critical point where the symmetry is also restored? One way to think about that in terms of a symmetry which is there on the lattice microscopically is via this duality symmetry. So, both of these phases do not have this duality symmetry, this self duality. 
But this phase does. This critical point does. Okay. Uh, many things are, are magical in uh, one spatial dimension of quantum field theory. Uh, you, you might think that all, all of that stuff that I said, just something that lives in low dimensions, maybe doesn't have much to do with, with higher dimensional physics. That actually turns out to be wrong. Uh, recently, there have been some understanding of how to lift those notions of symmetry into higher dimensions, which I'll tell you about now. So let's start with a little puzzle, which is about uh, something ancient. Chiral symmetry in quantum electrodynamics. Okay. So if you look at in quantum electrodynamics, let's look at uh, energies much larger than the electron mass. So we'll ignore the electron masses in this discussion. And we're going to consider scattering of photons and electrons and positrons. And there's a famous fact about such high energy scattering, which is that it preserves the total electron uh, and positron helicity. Not the photon velocity, but the, the sum of the electron and positron velocities. So, for instance, this Baba scattering, which has these two channels, preserves the sum of the velocity. And a kind of ancient puzzle, as uh, maybe fifty-year-old puzzle, as far as I'm, as far as I know, is why? Why is there this conservation principle? There is no conserved current that enforces this symmetry. So this is something that you know you could read about in textbooks. And people had various ways of explaining it or making peace with it, I think. But uh, this, this puzzle has existed for quite some time. And one idea, which actually turns out a kind of radical idea, that turns out to be correct, is actually there's a new kind of symmetry in quantum electrodynamics, the symmetry that had been overlooked. So this is our oldest, uh, in a sense, our oldest realistic three spatial dimension quantum field theory, and we're discovering a new symmetry there. And this symmetry is going to be fundamentally like Kramer's Wynier duality in the Ising model. It's going to have the feature that th this is why it's new, that it exchanges order and disorder. But it's a higher dimensional analog of that. So we have to say what we mean by order and disorder. So what, what is the order operator that we're talking about? Well, it's a higher order operator. It's a magnetically charged probe particle. The language that I was using before was in a tough line. So remember, we talked about for higher symmetry, the probe, the uh, the the charges were world lines. Here I'm focusing on a magnetically charged world line. So that's the higher order operator. What's the disorder operator? The disorder operator should be something like a surface operator if we're thinking in space time. I've drawn that picture over here. The, the higher disorder operator is an open magnetic Gaussian surface, something that could terminate on that line. So it's something like that. Now, this kind of symmetry, it turns out, actually explains, it enforces this helicity conservation. It also uh, has implications even in the pi on the game. So, you know, uh, massless limit of charged particles is something that occurs uh, that we think about a lot when we think about ion physics. And if you want to know how to uh, how to control this uh, pi gamma gamma uh, decay rate, pi zero gamma gamma decay rate, you need to think about this symmetry. So that's one very simple physical application. Now, why was it overlooked? So I, I told you one reason why it was overlooked um, uh, is that it acts very strangely. It maps order to disorder. That's sort of outside the usual paradigm of symmetry. Uh, but let me give you another reason, uh, which is kind of more algebraic reason, which will highlight again how, how, how strange this symmetry principle is. So let's look at the symmetry operator. Let's call it U, the thing that acts on the Hilbert space and implements this symmetry. And okay, here, here, here's U and here's U dagger. And we'd like to understand how to think about U. So the funny thing about this U is that it has some degrees of freedom living on it. If I think about these disorder operators that I was drawing in the previous uh, slide, these magnetic Gaussian surfaces, the ends of this disorder operator, when they hit this charge, are anions. These anions are in a fractional quantum Hall state coupled to the bulk electromagnetic field. 
usually when you think about asymmetry, when you think about the charge operator, you don't think that anything specifically lives there. There are no additional degrees of freedom that reside on the symmetry operator itself. But here, we have a situation where those degrees of freedom are essential to describing the symmetry. These anions in this fractional Hall state are essential for getting, uh, for realizing that this is a symmetry. And that leads to a very unusual phenomenon in the symmetry algebra of these operators. So we can consider U and U dagger. Of course, usually we think symmetry is described by unitary operators. But usually when U and U dagger collide, you just get one. But here we don't have that. When U and U dagger collide, something is left over, which is the mesh of these surface operators. I've tried to draw a cartoon here. This is a non-trivial operator, this mesh here. So this, this is a funny thing. There is no inverse to U. U times U dagger is some other operator. So this is a symmetry operator, which commutes with the Hamiltonian, implies selection rules, is useful for constraining dynamics, but is not unitary. It acts in a, it's not a unitary operator acting on open space. And that was actually the same for this Kramer's Vanier uh, duality operator in Eisenbach. So that, that operator, again, has no inverse in general. It's not represented by a unitary operator acting in open space. That's part of the reason why these symmetries uh, were overlooked, is that they fall a little bit outside the standard algebraic paradigm. Okay, so what's the, what, what's the frontier of this? What, what kind of uh, new application might you envision? I'll close with, uh, with uh, one possibility, which is a possibility for particle physics and for, uh, for beyond the standard model physics. So these new symmetries might play a role there. Why might you hope, be, be hopeful about that? Well, one key question that particle physics always faces is about naturalness. That's about the smallness of various couplings and masses in the Lagrangian, where we don't have any really re real reason to, to know why they are uh, so small. So here are some, here are a few that we might try to explain. The cosmological constant versus the Planck mass to the floor. The Higgs mass versus the Planck mass, that's this cartoon here. Uh, what about the neutrino mass versus the charged lepton mass? Now, whenever you have a symmetry principle, you should think that, ah, maybe this uh, symmetry can protect a small, a small number. For instance, well, one reason why people were so keen to look for supersymmetry is because they think that maybe supersymmetry can stabilize that small number, the Higgs mass versus the, pl the Planck mass. So we here have a new notion of symmetry in realistic models of particle physics and quantum electrodynamics. And you might wonder, well, can that new notion of symmetry help with any of these very old hierarchy problems? Okay, ask and you will receive. So uh, I will close by telling you about one, uh, one model that uh, we recently wrote down, which is like that. So uh, this is a model for one of those hierarchies that I wrote down on the previous slide, which is neutrino masses. So neutrino masses are you know, a sharp, Kind of leading signal of beyond the standard model of physics. Strictly in the standard model, neutrinos are massless. Of course, experimentally, we know that they're not massless. There are two big paradigms um, for thinking about neutrino masses. One is Majorana masses. Uh, and uh, in, in that, in the Majorana mass model, you don't introduce any new degrees of freedom um, to, to generate the masses. You should have something like a seesaw mechanism or something like that in mind. And in the Dirac neutrino mass case, which is what I'll focus on here, uh, you introduce new right-handed neutrinos, call them N, and you add to the standard model this kind of coupling. So H is the Higgs field, L is the lepton doublets, which contains both the neutrino and the charged lepton field, and N is the new uh, right-handed neutrino field. And, you, and when the Higgs field condenses, this generates a mass for, the, for neutrinos. Now, the, the paradox that you face when you introduce neutrino masses this way, is that it requires a very tiny coupling constant. So if Y is the Yukawa coupling in, the stand, in this extension of the standard model that uh, is important, that, that is needed for generating neutrino masses, then you have this uh, approximate ratio, that this size of this neutrino coupling constant relative to the standard lepton Yukawa generating masses 
is about 10 to the minus 11. So that's a small number. And we'd like to, uh, uh, then we'd like to understand, can we somehow stabilize that small number or explain that small number uh, using these new notions of symmetry? So uh, I'll just sketch one model, but if you're interested, there's a, there's a more detailed description in the paper. So one model uh, has kind of a, a basic paradigm like this. So you start with the standard model and you add, in addition to this right-handed neutrino, a Z prime. The Z prime is an extra U1, a new gauge boson. Lots of models have been written that way. And, uh, and then at higher scales, you imagine that this U1 is completed into some non-abelian group. It won't be very important which kind of non-abelian group it is for this discussion. Now, if this Z prime gauges L mu minus L tau, that's the so-called lepton family difference, one of the few global symmetries of the standard model that is possible to gauge, then you have an approximate Z3 symmetry. That Z3 symmetry is of the form that I showed on the previous, uh, on, on the previous slide. It is a uh, symmetry in kind of a massless electrodynamics-like theory. Now the U1 gauge field is this one, but one that obeys that funny fusion algebra involving non-unitary operators. And this generates naturally a higher optical mass scale when this symmetry is broken relative to the charge leptons. The kind of formula that we derive is, uh, is naturally this one. Y nu is Y tau times this kind of uh, factor where G is the coupling here. And this number is not that important. It all supplies. This is a very tight framework. It, it ties the scale of this non-abelian physics responsible for this symmetry breaking pattern to uh, the neutrino mass and the Z prime mass and coupling. So it's a it's a pretty tight uh, it's a pretty tight model. There aren't very many moving parts. So this is a, this is an example. Of course, it's a, it's beyond the standard model of physics. It is naturally speculative, but it's an example of how using these new symmetry principles, we can write down uh, easily kind of natural models that automatically generate these small numbers, at least for some hierarchies that we are interested in. Okay, so let, let me uh, conclude. So uh, I, I told you that many observables are built from symmetry. And we, we also talked about how generalizing the notion of symmetry to higher symmetries, or even algebraic and broader definitions of symmetry, uh, leads to a new paradigm to understand universal physics, kind of broadens the Landau paradigm, and allows us to think of uh, that maybe symmetry is all you need for characterizing phases of field theories. We saw this, uh, that, that the key thing there is this interplay between duality and a kind of novel form of symmetry, something that is uh, kind of previously overlooked or underappreciated. And finally, I told you about a kind of frontier direction which is that maybe, if you're lucky, these new symmetries might shed light on questions of naturalness, kind of old unsolved problems in particle physics. So I'll just conclude by saying that we succeeded in, in interpreting many of uh, Randall Monroe's uh, particle properties, but we have more to go, like hit points and, and so <laughs> forth. Uh, and uh, thanks for listening. Uh, can you discuss the mass of the, of the graviton and the same spirit? Ah, excellent question. Yes. Um, not yet in as convincing a way. Um, so the graviton in the linearized, uh, uh, in, in linearized general relativity does have a kind of emergent pattern of higher symmetry that fits in this, in this uh, framework. But that, as far as we currently understand, does not survive turning on the coupling. So it's, it's something that's there for, for weak coupling. Uh, it's for you know infinite Planck mass, if you like, but uh, but um, not not clear how to think about it in general. Yeah. Yeah. My question is about confinement and Yang Mills theory. Uh -huh. Back in the seventies, they both studied twisted gauge fields and the yes. periodic field of the box, and he considered how the free energy depends on the dimensions of the box. And he concluded that there were either electric flux tubes or magnetic flux tubes, or feel like either a Higgs phase or a confinement phase. And there was no way to distinguish between those two possibilities. They were both valid. 
You seem to be asserting that it has to be a confinement thing. No, no, I, I don't need to say more, more than that. So, um, so was there anything new beyond what was in that analysis of twisted gauge fields? So, with, with regard, I think that what was in that analysis of twisted gauge. Let me let me sort of answer that a little more technically. So, the the twisted gauge fields are like the background field for this concept of, of symmetry. So usually when you have uh, a current J, you talk about probing your theory with the background gauge field with a couple of K meters in here. Um, and Tulk's twisted uh, uh, twisted uh, field that field configurations that we talked about, those are the natural background fields for this um, uh, for this concept of symmetry. So um, I am not I am not making progress in the specific problem of confinement, I'm not making progress uh, relative to that. On the other hand, what I am doing is bringing that into the notion of symmetry. So I am kind of I am kind of enlarging um, the concept of symmetry such that that phase transition does not lie outside. It's not like some unicorn that you need to discuss with a The land out there is confined. For instance, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you mentioned this, you mentioned the hierarchy problem and like mass scales. And in the case of the, the left on mass generation, you have the luxury of an actual like, continuous, you know, old fashioned symmetry to protect the mass to be small. Do you envision, or does there exist any kind of higher form or extended notion of symmetry that would keep a mass light without, like, without having any kind of canonical motion, like, canonical motion technical mass? Like, are there any kind of symmetries that keep particles light that we, we wouldn't have an explanation for otherwise? Do you, do you see that as possible? Yes, I see it as possible. Um, I mean, I think we can. Uh, uh, I mean. Here I'm in the realm of, of weak coupling physics. So um, within weakly coupled physics, I think it's more challenging to envision that. But um, but uh, you know the kind of thing that you might hope for, uh, which maybe there are even models like that. If you if you think about the electroweak hierarchy problem, is maybe there are notions of symmetry that um, when you try to solve the electroweak hierarchy problem, one challenge with symmetry, one challenge that you face is that. It's hard to envision a notion of symmetry under which H dagger H is charged. Now, the, the reason that it's hard is because you think that you have to assign charge to H. Uh, that only makes sense if, if you're in a weakly coupled, if you're in a weakly coupled physics. H is the gauge variant of that it doesn't have to have a well defined charge. So in strongly coupled phases, um, I think it makes sense to even imagine that that operator itself being there. So it's a theoretical. Positive. Yeah. So, yeah. for instance, in composite gauge models, you might envision this. Now, composite gauge model is not so favored. So, maybe that's kind of a more interesting But, um, yeah, that's one. Of yeah, just one second question. So, so, you mentioned that this um, explanation for the velocity selection rules. Yeah. The cross theory. There's also velocity selection rules for the angles theory and like, other types of gauge theory that spin more. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting uh, question. I do not yet understand how to how to sort of say, you know, you know, for instance, the um, yeah, we should talk about it, but I don't yet understand how to bring those in here. Um, but I think that's a natural target. Yeah. So I have a few questions about your definition of high symmetry. So you introduced the high symmetry by looking at the uh, Maxwell equation, you say that there are more index. But if you compare Maxwell equation and the uh, conservation of stress tensor, like they have that same form. Like, uh, um, they don't have the same representation of the learns. So, um, so th this one, uh, this one is a, is a form, uh, and the stress tensor is a, this one is anti-symmetric, and the stress tensor is symmetric. Yeah. So, so that's a key difference. Yeah. But the stress test also like has two index because you mentioned that you I mean this one has more index like so that's what that confused me like how is this yeah so so more I mean a more technical thing is where does it make sense to integrate the current because because this is a, a two form because it has anti symmetric indices it makes sense to integrate the current over a surface it makes the so that's why the, the natural charge is being is this coming from this Gaussian surface. So, so that's that's sort of the mathematical difference. But so like, how do you exactly define high symmetry? For example, like in our normal, uh, you know, notion of symmetry in QFT, it's either the symmetry of the Lagrangian, or we consider like the field operator's former representation of the symmetry group. 
Yeah, and what's like your definition of high symmetry here? This one. So the, the symmetry in the quantum field theory is a topological operator in that theory. So if we have a topological operator that lives, say, only on a spatial slice or on something that's one less dimension in space time, that's an ordinary symmetry. If we have a topological operator that lives instead on a surface, something that's two dimensions down from all of space time, that's uh, that's one notion of higher symmetry. We can even consider going further down. So, so all possible topological operators in this framework fit into this umbrella of symmetry. And the notion of higher is just what dimension do they reside on. Uh, but how about the, the like, how is it related to raised by them or you know like why not have axiom this field on the notion of the field of the forms of representation of the Lorentz group? And like in this case, it seems that like it's a different conjunction completely. So the question is about how the stress time group fits here? No, 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 like how this like a notion of symmetry, like I mean, like for example, like oh, we have a fundamental assumption that the field operators form a unique representation of the symmetry group. Yeah. And uh, like uh, in this symmetry, the definition of symmetry seems that it's not really consistent with that, uh, like other notion. Of no, uh, I mean, it is. So, one of the, I mean, I would not, I would, uh, I would definitely not put this up on the board if it didn't subsume the ordinary notions of symmetry. So it, 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 it's definitely, uh, it definitely follows that if you look at say ordinary symmetries, which I emphasize are one down, they live on, on, on say spatial slices. Then the question is sort of what happens when a local operator tries to cross the symmetry operator? Well, then you, you naturally find from this formalism a representation. So that, that's built in here. That's something like a, that, that's something uh, some kind of rule that I didn't quite tell you about yet about how the topological operators behave when they collide with other operators. But in relativistic KFT, like uh, like uh, the symmetry is somehow related with the Hungary group, but this symmetry is not. Like for example, like a, the symmetry is related with the point group. So so we can we can talk about internal symmetries which don't have anything to do with space and time, and we can talk about external symmetries. Uh, which include point gray group. And the, the point gray, the stress tensor itself uh, would lead to various topological operators by, uh, by, this, by integrating components of the stress tensor over space. Those would be topological operators. Okay. So, so th that's in this, in this umbrella as well. Yeah, and like uh, for your definition of charge, like uh, our normal notion of charge is like the negative, negative charge is come from, you know, the symmetry of the ground here. Yeah. How is the charge in this theory defined? Well, one of the one of the reasons for adopting this seemingly more abstract uh, definition is to try and get away from thinking about Lagrangians. So, Lagrangian setup is incorporated here, but just to to say one thing, which is that a, a Lagrangian is a fundamentally weakly coupled notion. It's something that has to do with free fields weakly grand. That's so. If we're trying to think about what might we mean by symmetry of a quantum system. Uh, when we don't, when everything is strongly coupled, we don't have a nearly free theory, we need a more powerful and intrinsic definition. So you can get, so if you have a weakly coupled Lagrangian, you can find, all, all, if you do the Noether procedure, you'll find currents, you can build topological operators. In this case, it's just a rephrasing. Okay? But it, incorpor it incorporates uh, what you're saying, but it's a rephrasing. On the other hand, if, um, if you, uh, uh, if you don't have weakly act interacting fields, uh, I, I don't really know alternate definitions for what you might mean by symmetry other than this. Uh, but for example, like, well, another notion is like charge, the label of the representation of the symmetry. And how is your charge, like your definition? Of I, I mean, I didn't tell you, I, right here, I, I didn't tell you how to read off the representations. The representations come when I think about what happens when topological operators in my system collide with other operators. Then I get represented. Uh, how about your definition of charge? I'm sorry, I still even get like how to define a charge in this case. So, for for instance, a local operator crossing a uh, an ordinary symmetry operator is acted on by some phase when it crosses, and that phase is the charge. Okay, there are no more questions. So thanks, again. <laughs>